Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. This is going to be a long one, so I apologize in advance, but the background details are necessary for the story. I, a 23-year-old female, was recently in Africa on vacation with my family and we stayed two nights at a desert camp in the Sahara. The first night, my sister and I were talking and hanging out with the guys who work there, who were all probably around age 20 to 35. It seemed that they were just friendly and harmless. I noticed at the campfire that night that one of the guys started paying more attention to me, and I felt a little uncomfortable, but I figured that it was just a language barrier or something. So out in the desert, you can see the stars really well and even the Milky Way on clear nights, but you have to wait for the moon to go down which is around 2 a.m. I guess it's a normal thing for the guys to come around to the tents, which are luxury tents, furnished with beds, lights, and a toilet and a shower, as well as a lock on the doors. So, not really normal camping. They knock on the door to see if you're awake and want to come out and look at the stars. My sister and I were sharing a tent, and my parents in a separate one across the walkway. The first night around midnight, I told my sister that I was too tired to go out because I was falling asleep, so she left to look at the stars without me, and I didn't lock the door because I didn't want her to get locked out if I fell asleep. Fast forward about an hour, and I'm on my side asleep, when I wake up suddenly to see a head peeking in from the tent door. I thought it was my sister, so I groggily ask her. Uh, what the hell are you doing? Because it was just weird the way that she was standing there. I start to wake up more, and I realize that it's this freaking guy from the campfire's head peeking in my room while I'm asleep. Now, I know it could have been a simple misunderstanding, but I felt totally violated with my privacy especially because we were on their territory in the middle of the freaking desert. Like, I'm not kidding, we had to take a 30-minute truck ride into the dunes. I was in a fight or flight at that moment. He literally woke me up with a panic attack, and I started to have to nervous shit. So, I went to the door and told him that I was tired, and he kept trying to get me to come out to the dunes with a blanket. But... I just kept saying no that I didn't feel good and I was tired. At this moment, I don't know where my sister is and I don't know where my family is. I'm very disoriented and all I know is that this man is standing in front of me and was literally just watching me sleep. I don't know how long he was there for. It could have been a literal second or it could have been two minutes. But either way... I was hikey horrified. I told him no again, and I said I'd go look at the stars tomorrow night. He told me that he wouldn't be at camp the next night, and that's why he wanted to go out tonight. But I wouldn't budge. And once he realized that I wasn't going to come outside, he asked me if he could have my number, and I told him no and that I have a boyfriend. I really don't, but... It seemed that was the only way that this man would respect my disinterest by knowing that there was another man in the picture. After I said that, he asked me for my first name and I gave it to him because I thought it wouldn't do any harm. I then said goodnight and locked the door this time. I went right to the bathroom and had diarrhea and while I was on the toilet, I heard him come back and start calling my name from outside of the tent. But I just stayed quiet and I didn't say anything. I finished in the bathroom and I lay down in my bed, still trying to calm down from what had just happened because my heart was racing. I heard him come back again calling my name and I laid in bed as still as I could and I didn't say anything. I tried texting my dad but he was not answering 
and I didn't feel comfortable leaving the tent. Finally, my sister came back and my dad was with her, so I told him what just happened and they were confused and thought that it was weird. And that was kind of it. The next day I brought it up at the breakfast again, and my sister and dad basically told me that I was being dramatic and that I should just stop talking about it already because it wasn't that big of a deal. My mom was the only one who was like, yeah, that's not okay at all. And the second night, my sister and I were both out under the stars, talking to the guys and relaxing. Keep in mind, it's very, very dark, and you can't see any faces. So I was having a normal conversation with this one guy, and all was well. But after a while, he asked me if I remember him, and I'm like, well, no, I can't see you. And he's like, oh, then shine a light. And so I do. And wouldn't you guess, it's the same weirdo from my tent. I especially wasn't expecting him to be the dude in front of me because he had told me that he wouldn't be there that night, which leads me to believe that he picked up a shift just to see me. But I can't be too sure. But surprisingly, he was fine that night and respected my boundaries, so I didn't say anything to the guys who ran the camp. I was planning on doing so if he did anything remotely uncomfortable, but he didn't. The next morning, we left the area, and a few days later, I start getting message requests on Instagram. Would you believe, this freaking weirdo found me. I tagged the whole entire desert, and like you're telling me he found me based on my name and location. Not even a specific location, an entire desert. And my name isn't unique either. Well, anyway, he messages me, and although I'm creeped out, I'm also thinking... Okay, well, now he's harmless. Might as well see what he says. And he says, which is a direct quote. You know, I'm really so happy to find your account. I was looking all the time. Which I found highly creepy to even say to someone. But again, it could have been just a cultural difference. But who knows? I didn't answer and he messaged me again a few days later asking how I am, but I didn't answer. So yeah, I'm curious what you guys think about this, and if I was really overreacting, or if you think that my gut feeling was right. He seemed to be harmless in the end, but you never know. When I was in 6th grade, I often went to the park after school to play. It was always fun. But one summer's day, something weird and unforgettable happened. I saw a woman who looked just like me. She was an office worker, and she was clearly a lot older than me. But nonetheless, all of my friends said that she looked just like me. It was like she was the grown-up version of me. I remember that as soon as my friends laid eyes on her, they started shouting. Hey, she looks like you. We were always noisy. I mean, that wasn't anything out of the ordinary. I guess that we were a rowdy bunch back then. Usually, when we were being loud, any adults or teenagers passing by would either tut at us or ignore us, but not that office worker who looked like me. She just stood there and stared at me and my friends. It was creepy, and once me and my friends had quieted down a little, we just kind of stared at the office worker, and we were stuck in a silent standoff. I started to get a little worried, and I didn't look away from the office worker, but I think that my friends were feeling the same as I was. I started to wonder if the person who was staring at us had some kind of sinister intentions. However, just as I was reaching the height of my concerns, 
the office worker stopped staring. And I chose that moment to look back at my friends just to see their expressions. And by the time that I looked back at the office worker, she was gone. After she went away, my friends and I slowly began to relax and we got to a point where we were able to joke about the situation. They were making fun of me for having a creepy doppelganger. It was all fun and games that day, but when I thought about it later that night, there was something a bit less funny and a bit more disturbing about that experience. It was a weird day, and one I thought about for a while after. Fast forward to when I was 22 years old, I had a strange dream at that age. I was living in a city miles away from my hometown, but in the dream I had, I was alone in the same park that I used to play in as a kid. I felt very nostalgic to be back and somewhat lonely. I looked ahead into the park. It was a bright sunny day and all the playground equipment looked nice and new, just like it did when I was a kid. I saw myself as a child playing in that park. I was with my friends and I was laughing as my friends were pointing and screaming about someone who looked just like me. I just stood there like a statue staring and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I guess that I wasn't aware that I was dreaming. Suddenly, I felt an intense feeling that I wanted to leave. I felt as if I didn't belong there. I just needed to go. I wanted to go home. I felt a sense of fear which I can only describe as being lost. It was a very strange emotion to experience. I just wanted to go home, so I turned to leave. That's the last thing I remember before waking up. I expected to wake up at home, but I didn't. I woke up in a hospital bed. I had no idea how I got here. I was told that I had gotten into an accident while I was on my way to work. I used to ride to work on my motorbike. I have no idea who hit me. But I'm sure that they never got into any trouble with the authorities. It was a hit and run. And it turned out that I had just come out of a coma. Apparently, I was walking the tight rope between life and death. And if my life had been a candle, it would have been flickering. A few days after I regained my consciousness, I was finally discharged from the hospital. I left with worry in my heart, and I couldn't forget about the dream that I had before I woke up. I saw what I saw when I was in the sixth grade, and then again in a dream at age 22. I found that the clothes that I was wearing when I had my accident... I was wearing business clothes under my leathers. I saw my future self that day when I was younger. I am certain of that. I'm not sure why or how, but I know what I saw. Perhaps the reason that I am still here, the reason why I was able to wake up, was because of that interaction with what I thought at that time was a doppelganger. When I saw myself in the park as an adult, and I remember the interaction. Perhaps that was the trigger that I needed to wake up from my coma dream. It was absolutely unexplainable, but I count each day as a blessing. What was that? A glitch? Was I saved for some reason? Whatever it is, it is beyond my comprehension. But I am grateful. I have been clean from all drugs since 2019. It took me a while to write this, and I never thought that I would be posting because of how stupid I was and the stupid mistakes that I made. I know, I will get a lot of duh comments on here, so just don't even say it. I already know. I am telling the story to remind people that everyone's intentions are not what they say they are. I am mentally traumatized from this experience, 
and I get reminders of it every day. I am grateful to be alive, and I have no idea what would have happened if I didn't get away when I did. So just save the rude and cruel comments. Thanks. This story is based in September of 2017. I believe it was such a freaking blur. I did whatever I could to survive in this harsh world, so please, no judgment. I was on the streets with no family, an inactive crack, and soon-to-be meth addiction. Backstory, I started using crack in 2015, and I figured out that if I sold my body, I could make easy money. I know, not ideal, but I was deep in addiction, and at that point, I didn't care about anything. But in January of 2017, I met Ty, who also smoked crack, but worked every day, so I no longer had to do that. I was going on like eight months free from selling my body and soul. And also, when I met Ty, he had a place in this big city and he did a lot of work for people in the city. I was left on the street by the man that I thought I had loved at that time. I must have said something wrong because he flipped out and left with everything I owned in his truck. <laughs> we spent days getting high and I was sure he was just throwing a fit, so I went over to a friend's house. Let's call him S. It was my home away from home and I felt safe there. S was older, maybe a 60-year-old man who liked to get high and over time, he became one of my best friends. I was able to take a shower and then put on clean clothes. And when I was all done, I remember sitting on the couch with disbelief that Ty would just leave me like that. I started crying and wishing things had been different, while S held me and comforted me. I knew deep down that I needed a fresh start, to depend on myself and live a happy life. And across the street from S's house was a hometown bar where rappers and musicians would perform. And on that particular night in the bar, it had been filled with people from the bigger city about half an hour away. Well, let me explain. Where I come from, there isn't really a place for addicts to go and get clean. They do have a women's shelter, which I had been to before. About 30 minutes away is a bigger city where they have all the help you can ask for if you are willing to do the work. At this point, I was ready to get away from everything and everyone. I had no hope of cleaning up my life if I stayed anywhere close to where I was using. Remember, you have to remove old playmates, playthings, and playgrounds. So that's what I needed to do. I went right over to the bar and found a semi-good-looking guy heading back to the city that I needed to go. I told him that I had planned to go to the shelter in the morning, and he told me that I could just go with him and he will take me in the morning. On the ride, I remember feeling like a whole hundred bricks was lifted off my shoulders. I had nothing but the clothes on my back and a phone with no minutes. I asked the guy I was with that was driving. He had a pretty sweet ride, by the way. I said, You don't mess with this, right? And I pulled out my crack pipe. He shook his head so I rolled down the window and just let it go. I knew that going into the shelter, I had to get better. Not just for me, but I had kids and a family that at that time still hoped that I would get better. I wanted to start over. I just didn't know how hard it was going to be. Me and this random dude go to his friend's house and we smoke a blunt and I don't remember nothing after that. I woke up on the floor of a clean room and I mean clean, like there was nothing in it. It smelled like paint as I looked around and I realized this was the place the dude was talking about moving into and renting. And I got up, and he took me to get coffee and ride over to the shelter. I was freaking terrified of what I was walking into. I had no idea what to expect, and all I knew was that I needed to get better for my life, and I needed to do it now. 
as we drove into downtown, I got a little nervous because I knew downtown was full of crime and drug dealers, big buildings and confusing signs, tons of people in traffic, and then I realized that I was going to have to work really hard to get my life back. We pulled onto the street and before I knew it, he was dropping me off. And there I was, standing in this big beautiful clean lobby, just feeling lost and broken. I had been with Ty for almost seven months, and this was the first time that he left me like this, so I was kind of hurt over that. I knew he had been seeing someone else in our recent month breakup, and he wasn't afraid to show it. The place. It smelled like lime, with spotless white walls. I walked up to the desk, and I was asked if I was homeless. Yes, I said, and she didn't even ask any questions. She just looked at me with sad eyes and said, Okay, hun, let's get you set up. She took me to a small room full of boxes, and she hands me one. She explained that it was for my personal things, toilets and etc. I looked at her with unsettling eyes, and I replied that I didn't have any belongings, that I had lost everything the night before. And the nice lady gave me some toiletries and a pair of leggings. Next was the intake where I had to answer a bunch of questions, and I was handed a paper with all the rules on it, and on top of the paper... It stated that there was no Wi-Fi in or around the building. You had to go down to the stop sign to get internet. My phone was off, but I could still use Wi-Fi. But at that time, I wasn't really worried about it. I knew Ty was already probably staying with that other girl. Michelle was her name, so I didn't feel it was necessary to even try to use my phone. I decided to cut off everyone and try to be different. When she was done giving me the rundown on how things worked, she took me into the day room. Walking from the lobby was weird, and I remember feeling sick going through the double doors with stairs off to the left. Under the stairs was a pile of mats, and I was told to grab one. I followed her through another set of double doors into the day room, which was huge, and it was filled with at least 50 females. A lot of older ladies with nowhere to go, but it was loud and bright. The wall to my left was full of lockers, which I was told that I would get one if I stayed there long enough, and in front of that wall was about 10 to 15 round tables set up where most of the girls were sitting playing cards, coloring, and talking. On the other side of the room was the shower or bathroom, and a small TV that sat on a cart with wheels on it, and next to the cart was an end table that had an electrical strip full of chargers and phones. In the far back right corner was a door that led outside to go smoke. It was nice. There was picnic tables and lawn chairs set up with a huge fence in the yard for the kids to play in. Now when 7pm hit, the whole dynamic of the room changed. Everyone was moving around, people were running in, and then you would hear it over the speaker. Roll call! Then we were instructed to go and get one mat to sleep on. They passed out the blankets and pillows to those who were without, and they let us keep the TV on. The first night was scary and lonely. Here I was in a strange place, not even two full days clean off of a week-long crack bench. I was up half of the night with my head just racing. I finally fell asleep when the other girls started to get quiet. The morning came way too fast and the rule was you had to get up at 7 a.m. You didn't have to leave, but you had to get up. A lot of older ladies didn't even leave the shelter. They knew they had a place to stay and had nothing else to do all day, so they hung out together at the shelter all day long. I had to go upstairs for breakfast, which was okay. I'm not really a breakfast person, but that morning I was starving, and I had the whole deal eggs, bacon, and milk. And after breakfast, 
I went out to smoke, and I noticed this tiny black girl with cornrows in her hair had some cards in her back pocket. I had been playing cards since I was a kid. My dad taught me a few games, and I played with friends and I also had done some time in jail in the past. I was lonely, and I didn't know where anything was, and it was obvious that I needed help. I asked her name and if she wanted to play cards, and after two games, we had a connection. She was cool and she liked me so I was okay with that. I can be awkward around you people and females tend to not like me, so I find it hard sometimes to make friends. She asked me after we played a few more games of Rumi if I wanted to go to McDonald's with her. I was cool with that because I needed to learn the area anyway. On the walk there, as we were talking, something caught my eye. So I looked up and there he was. It was Ty. With all of my belongings in his truck, he drives right by us. I try to call, but he ignored me every time. Guess he was done with me for good this time. That really crushed me. I wanted to fall to the ground and just sink till I disappeared, but instead, I had about 10 different emotions running through my body all at once. I was so angry that he was just looking for a reason to leave me since the month before when we broke up, and I stayed with my dad for a while. He started seeing this Michelle, and I was absolutely devastated. We continued our walk to McDonald's as I was silent and broken. That night was easier to sleep because I was exhausted from not having any sleep and just feeling done. I slept like a baby to be honest. The next day, Mish wanted to show me this place where she goes to get good free lunch, and the only thing was, it was a church, and we had to sit through a 30-minute sermon, which was cool with me. We were standing outside waiting on the church to open their doors, and this blacked-out Mercedes with a trailer hauling a bad-ass Harley pulled up and parked in front of the church. I then heard my loud mouth say, Damn, that's a nice freaking setup. I looked at Mish and then looked back at the Harley. That's when I saw him. I specifically remember everyone knowing who he was. Will is what they call him. I remember getting excited to meet new people and be a part of a new community. Everyone was really nice going into the church. A guy at the door walking in gave us a pamphlet of mealtimes and services offered. I followed Mish to one of the back pews and I slide in behind her. The church was pretty, different colors and there was a choir singing in a low and almost quiet tone as people around us are taking their seats. I kind of froze when the guy I saw come in, Will, he sat next to me. I looked at Mish and then I quickly noticed his gold watch. It could have been fake, but it almost looked like a Rolex. He was an older black gentleman, talked real smooth when he introduced himself with his hand out. I was shocked that he wanted to shake my hand. No one in my life does that. I shook his hand, and they were creamy like he takes very good care of them, and obviously does not work a physically demanding job. He was nice dressed and had this pimp hat on like a fedora, and it had a feather in it. His cologne was strong but smelled good like a man. He was handsome and smooth, and was also very confident. And sitting through the sermon, I found it hard to pay attention to the preacher. I remember looking at his clean shiny black leather shoes, and his socks were black and thick. And when the service was finally over, people started heading to the dining area. I just followed Mish through, and we got our food. She picked an empty space to eat in one of the end of the long tables, full of chairs. And not even five minutes, not paying attention to our surroundings, just eating. Will came over and sat three seats away from me. He looked at Mish and said, Do you mind? I don't know why I didn't see the red flags. Of course, I see them now. But looking back, I was so clueless. 
He hardly said a word the whole time that we were eating, and when he was done, he got up, threw his stuff away, and I assumed he left. Mish and I decided to go home, play some cards, and go to a clothes bank she knew about. We were walking home and talking when he pulled up next to us. He rolled down his window and asked if we needed a ride home, but he was looking at me with a deep stare and I looked back at Mish and she refused. Smart girl. But I went with him. Dumb girl. I think I was more curious than anything. I had to know how he made that kind of money and I remember wanting that. We drove around till my curfew and we just talked. I don't know what it was, I think we had a lot in common, and we related a lot. He asked me how I ended up at this shelter, and just asking questions so I told him. I don't know what it was, and I'm not sure if I trusted him, but I told him about my past anyway, how I sold my body for drugs, and how horrible it was, and I even said that I was glad that I didn't do it anymore. He didn't say much about it and we agreed that we would continue our talk the next day, and he would help me put in a couple applications, and he had some errands too. I woke up the next morning to a text from Will that said, What if you made that kind of money, but spent it on yourself, not drugs, and everything you make will go to you building your life? Just think about it. I thought about it. I'm not going to say why I agreed, and went with the idea that this would work and I could actually get my life together and get my kids back. Two hundred dollars, a half hour, I could be free. I chose to go with him, and at that time, I think he thought that I wanted to be with him, but really, I just wanted a way out of the situation I was in. I hated that stinky, loud shelter and I wanted out. He got a room at a motel, and we dropped off my stuff, and he told me that I needed some new clothes. He did tell me that he was just fired from a trucking company. He was a truck driver, and he was currently trying to find another job as far as I knew. He took me shopping, and he got me a few new outfits. More or less outfits to take pictures in to bring the money. I knew what I was getting into, and I was preparing my mind to handle everything that was about to happen. Will did tell me that if I went with him, I had to stay clean and have a clear mind to make money and be smart. Looking back at how manipulative he was and made me believe that I would do this to make my life better, I started doing this a few times before I got addicted so I could make rent or bills, so I knew. I could mentally do it, but I was still unsure about where this was going to go. We get back to the hotel and I do my thing. I take my pictures and post them, and it didn't take long before I started to get calls. I did make some money, and I kept every penny and Will took me shopping. I remember the shoes I bought. They were black and gold baby fats. Oh, I love those shoes. I got like six or seven cute outfits some makeup and hair dye, and I remember I came to the shelter with nothing, so being able to get all of this stuff made me feel so good. I was confident in myself and hopeful that I could get to a place and start a new life within a few weeks, if days like that repeated itself. Remembering how things went, I am starting to think that this was part of his game, making girls think that they can do it and keep all the money and then just trap them and make them need you. It's sick. He tricked me. He made me think that I could finally live a clean life. Yeah, I was escorting, but I treated it like a job. I bought another phone so I had a new number, and I used the older phone for work, and it turned off at like 5 p.m. I thought wrong. I later that day went back over to the shelter and grabbed the one shirt that I had and some personal things and I left with Will. That night was cool, he was super chill, and we talked in separate beds. We got a two bed and he didn't act like he had any interest in me, that which I was actually happy about because I didn't want to be with anyone. 
I needed a break from my emotional attachment. After Ty left me, I felt like I wouldn't trust anyone like that in a long time, so I was happy that I was comfy in bed, watching TV, freshly showered, with money in my pocket, and I had the best night's sleep, and I woke up to breakfast and time to get up and get myself together. He got up early, went and got his breakfast and coffee, he ate with me, and then left. He said that he will be back in a couple hours to take my time and to do what I gotta do. So I did just that, and while he was gone, I dyed my hair, took a hair, and the works, and not long after I was done and waited for him, the door opens and a female walks in. She's pale and has a beautiful face, long pretty blonde hair that ran down her shoulders. She was real petite, way too skinny in a size B chest, pretty big blue eyes that had dark circles under them, and it looked like she had been crying and she was carrying a black trash bag that contained all of her possessions. Will walked in behind her and introduced her as Anna and that she needs some help too. He instructed me to get her together, get her pretty and get some pictures and post them. He then told her to go on and take a shower and then asked to talk to me outside. We went outside the door and as I was shutting it, his voice got real stern and said, I see you have not made any money yet. Why the hell is that? I tried to explain that Sundays were the slowest days and that I would be lucky to make any money today. But before I could finish, he cut me off and said, I don't give a damn. You need to make some money. What do you think? This hotel pays for itself? I will pay for it tonight, but for now, you pay half and half of all expenses. Now, go make some money. I couldn't even believe he was talking like this. I never seen him so mad, and his voice scared the hell out of me. I looked at him when he cut me off, and I could see him get angry. His eyes got wide, and the white just disappeared, and they became all black. I was scared, but I did what he said. He then left me alone with her, while he went out and got food and whatever he did. While Anna got out of the shower, and her skin was more exposed, as she walked out of the bathroom in a small towel. I knew she was addicted to IV use. I assumed heroin, and she confirmed it after I asked her if it was going to be a problem to not do drugs because that was his rule for me. Why would it be a rule for the other girls? After my kid's father passed away from an overdose, I didn't like to surround myself with girls I knew I could get close to. I try to help, and something happens, so I cut all of that out. And when she told me, I was like, Okay, no, girl, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to make some calls because you can't stay here. At that point, I didn't even care what the hell Will has to say. I don't want her here, period. And as soon as he came through the door, I stopped him and I took him outside. I just told him that I didn't think I could work with her. I didn't want to be around a heroin addict or any kind of addict at that matter. He did make her pack her bathroom and clothes up and took her home. I think he was trying to please me for some reason. Will and I then took a ride to Main Street where all the girls walk and work. It was so weird. Remember how I said he knew everyone at church? He knew all those girls, business owners, police officers, and other men who drove drug dealer cars. I don't know why. I didn't just run then. I will never know. About an hour or two of driving around, talking to a bunch of different girls, this random ass girl jumps in the car. It was crazy. They had known each other for years, I guess, and she had been looking for him and wanted to make some money. She was quite a bit older than me, but still really pretty like beautiful, 
She had long, thick, curly, jet black hair. I didn't really get a look at her until we got back to the hotel. Will told me that he wanted to get a few girls together and make some big money. I was always going to be number one and I will never post with another female because I am the number one. He told me that I was important and we were building our own family. Amy was tall and thick but she was gorgeous. Big blue eyes, pretty skin, small waist with a big round butt and she was a straight up bitch. She took benzos and she was prescribed to them, I guess so he allowed it. It wasn't long before. I couldn't help but watch her. She was popular and then like at night, she would be falling out and nodding off. It drove me crazy. I think I even started a fight with Will about it once. I didn't think it was fair, honestly. Like, that bitch can get high, but I can't? Hell no. What Will would do was during the day, he would leave me at the hotel to make money and he took Amy to the street and worked her. Well, it was in two days before they came home with another girl. A young one, 18, her choice, no family. I only know what they tell me and her name was Amanda. She was short like me and a little chunky, which was okay. Guys like chunky too. She had blonde long hair and a cute face. She was sweet and didn't say much, and I tried to get to know her a little better, but she wasn't around for long. I posted her with Amy, and she didn't get much of a feedback. More people were calling for Amy, and Amanda stayed with us for a few days before she decided that she wanted to go home. Will, Amy, and I didn't stay at the hotel for long and we ended up deep into the city, the farthest away from my hometown. Bigger room and a little nicer hotel with a view for the whole city. It had a little shitty microwave and a drive-up entrance to your room. Will and Amy brought home two girls that night. I don't remember them much, because I wasn't involved with them much. I posted them, and the next few days we made money. Every time a girl would make money, they would give it to Will because he had them believe that he was saving it for them and getting them anything they wanted. I continued to make money on my own, and I also gave him my money. I got suspicious, and I will never forget the moment I knew that I was not safe. I was outside smoking a cigarette, I wasn't out there long, but when I came back into the room, Will had all three girls posing on the bed as he was coaching them on how to pose and taking snaps of them. I didn't say a word and closed the door slowly. I don't know why I felt the way I did, but it just didn't feel right. I don't know if he heard me open and close the door, but I heard him yell my name and said he needed me. He handed me his phone and told me to post the pictures. When I got onto the website and tried to post the pictures, it now wanted money instead of posting ads for free. Will unhappily ran to wherever and put money on a card. When I tried to put the card in, it wouldn't accept it and said it wanted Bitcoin. I informed Will and even showed him the page that it wasn't going to post. He got furious and yelled at me. He turned and walked out of the room. I looked at everyone else and tried to apologize for his actions and to stay calm and that it will be okay. He came right back in with a gun in his hand. I didn't even know he owned a gun. He hit me in the face with it and said that I needed to find somewhere to post the ad and do it or I am done and then he left. I don't know if he realized he did that in front of three other girls and I didn't know what or I'm done meant either. I was freaking terrified, and that's when I knew that I had to find a way to escape. I learned real quick that I wasn't able to just leave any time I wanted anymore. After Amy got involved, Will changed. He started talking about taking us girls to New York and making big money and travel and go here and there, and that alone scared the hell out of me. I wanted to build a life to get my kids back, not to leave state to trick and maybe get killed or abandoned. No, none of that. 
I got fearful for my life when he hit me with a gun. I have been hit before, punched like a man, but I have never been hit with a gun. That night, I had a couple dates set up, and Will knew he had to take the girls and leave, and I decided to make my plan to get away. The first date, I made 200, and I put 50 in my purse, and then put 50 in a pocket in a bra hidden away, and I left the rest on the table. The second date, I made 150, put half hidden away, and the rest on the table. Will came in the door not long after I was finished and grabbed the money off the table. My purse was sitting right there and I didn't see him do it, but he took the money out of my purse and said that he had something to do and left again. That was when I made my escape. I made a hundred calls before I finally reached someone who was willing to help me. He had a friend come and pick me up and bring me to his house. And I will never forget the feeling that I had when I was running out to the car with a trash bag full of stuff that I have collected in the past three weeks. I was scared to death that he would come pulling up and see me. That feeling didn't leave me until we hit the highway. I wanted to tell this story because I have never been able to get through telling it. I couldn't help to think where I would be if I stayed and if I would even be alive. So, Will, let's never meet again. And here are the top comments for my last video. And here's the riddle for this video. Hello, everyone. It's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember... Your fear feeds me.